So a couple weeks ago, God just laid it on my heart. He told me that there was something that I had to tell you. Can you turn me down a little bit? It's really loud. Yeah. And as I was kind of contemplating what I wanted to tell you, what God wanted me to tell you, it kind of evolved into a few different things. It started as I wanted to tell you about the attributes of Jesus Christ. And then I kind of like focused a little bit more and I got into what I really wanted to tell you is who created you? I talked about this a little bit a couple of weeks ago when we were talking about, when I was doing the announcements, talked about worship. And I said, you guys are worshiping the creator. You remember that? So that's what I wanted to focus on tonight. I want you guys to understand who created you and why. So let's pray. I like to pray before because we're talking to the creator, right? So let's pray. God, thank you for sending your son to us. Thank you for creating us. Thank you for creating the universe that we're a part of. Thank you for ultimately designing it around us and designing us in your image. Thank you for loving us, Lord. I pray that you open our hearts tonight. Help us to understand the beautiful word that you've created. Help us to understand your son and who he is. Thank you for everyone here, God. Amen. So I'm going to start. What's the last book of the Bible? Do you, does anybody know what the traditional name for Revelation is? It's the Revelation of Jesus Christ. Okay. So the whole book is really about Jesus Christ. It's about him coming back and restoring Jerusalem or restoring the new temple, restoring earth and coming back in his full glory with defeating the devil, defeating sin, and having peace on earth really again, right? So I'm going to start, I'm going to give you a lot of scripture tonight and that's what I want you guys to focus on because the scripture is the word of God, right? We're going to, I'm going to get a little, little bit more into what the word of God is here in a second. But Revelation 19, 11 through 16 says, Now I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. He who sat on him was called Faithful and True. So faithful and true. That's who, what Jesus is called, right? Isn't that awesome? His righteous, and in his righteousness, he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew but himself. When I read that, I always wonder, what was actually written there? When, and why did only he know it? I have no idea. It's a real question. I have no idea. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. Jesus Christ is the Word of God. The armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword. Does anybody remember anywhere else in the Bible where it says a sharp sword or a sharp two-edged sword? No? Okay. What was that? Not quite. So, okay, I'll keep going, I'll explain it. That with it, so with the sharp sword, he should strike the nations. And he himself will rule with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress wine press of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So I wanted you, what I wanted you to get out of that was the sharp sword. The sharp sword that came out of Jesus' mouth is the word of God, right? So he came back. This is, the, so this is at the end. This is at the end of time. This is a prophecy that God gave to John. He came and conquered the nations, the evil nations. He conquered Satan with the word of God, with that sword, right? Which is Hebrews 4.12. The word of God is alive and powerful, 
It's sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword, cutting between soul and spirit, between joint and marrow. It exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God. Everything is naked and exposed before his eyes. And he is the one whom we are, whom we are accountable to. The words that Jesus spoke are truth and they have the power to create. These are the same words that were spoken at the beginning in Genesis when God spoke and created everything, right? He created you at the beginning. That the timeline of all creation that was going to end up with you being here right now was spoken out of the mouth of God. And Jesus Christ is that creator. He is the one that was there. He is the one that spoke those words and bang, it happened. Creation happened. The earth was there. And Jesus himself talked about this. He talked about being there before creation. So in John 8, 58, he said, I tell you the truth. This is Jesus talking. I tell you the truth, before Adam was, I am. In Luke 10, 18, he said, I was there. I saw heaven fall, heaven, I saw Satan fall from heaven like lightning. Is that not insane? I don't think we realize that nowadays when we see like, we'll go on Facebook and we'll see a picture of a robed dude, a robed white dude, like Jesus was not white. Why, why, are, why are all the pictures of Jesus white? It's crazy. Jews are not white. But anyway, so we see this picture. We'll see like a picture of this man on Facebook or on a wall somewhere, and we think, that's Jesus. But it really isn't. Jesus Christ is the creator. He was there when Satan fell from heaven. He is, he is God. Colossians, no, one more. Revelation twenty two sixteen. I am both the source of David and the heir to his throne. So do you guys remember that the, there was a prophecy that Jesus would come from the line of King David? So a few generations after King David, Jesus was born through Mary, who was in the line of David. So he says, I am the source of David. I created King David. Is that not insane? Is that cool? How the, all this wraps together? Colossians 1, 15 through 20. Christ is the, the visible image of an invisible God. He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all of creation. So he existed before anything was created. I don't know about you guys, but when I think of Jesus, I don't often think of that. I don't think like, wow, he lived in eternity. He, he was there before creation. He wasn't just this, this baby in a manger. He wasn't just a man for 33 years. He was there for all time. For through him, God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. And I think when it says heavenly realms here, it's talking about the stars in the sky the, the moon, you know, the universe, the things that aren't on heaven, or aren't, aren't on earth. We made the things, he made the things that we can see and the things that we can't see, such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, and authorities of the unseen world. And there he's talking about angels, and then he created the angels that fell, which now are demons. Everything was created through him and for him. He existed before anything else, he holds all of creation together. How profound is that? Jesus Christ holds all of creation together. Christ is the head of the church, which is his body. He is the beginning, supreme over all who rise from the dead. So who, who are the ones that rise from the dead here? Does anybody know that? Does anybody know the Apostles' Creed? No? <laughs> okay. <laughs> so in the Apostles' Creed, it says, the, we believe in the resurrection of the church. 
So at the end, in Revelation, all of the church, which is the body of Christ, which is the believers, all those that believed in him will be resurrected in the end so that we can live with him in eternity in, in the final heaven city that he creates. So those are who he's talking about here. So he is supreme over all who rise from the dead. So he is first in everything. For God, in all his fullness, was pleased to live in Christ. And through him, God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. So God used a human body to come to earth. That's another thing I don't think we think about a lot. Jesus is not just the Son of God. He is God, right? He is in heaven. He is God. And he made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. The interesting thing here is that he is both creator and created. He became a created man. And that's the, the beauty of the grace and the beauty of the, the forgiveness that is Jesus Christ is that he saw that we needed a way to be reconciled to him or a way to... Um, another verse is, for there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Jesus Christ, who gave himself a ransom for all and to be testified in due time. That's 1 Timothy 2, 5-6. That's another word, a mediator, is a person who attempts to make people involved in a conflict come to an agreement. So we were in a conflict with God because we were living a sinful life, right? Before we have Jesus Christ, we're, we're in conflict with God. We are not, we're not going to go to heaven if we don't have Jesus Christ because we're sinful. So he created a man, a created man, to become to come to, uh, to earth to die for us. That is just insane to me. So I have some more uh, verses I want to throw at you that, that talk about him being a created man. Hebrews 2, 14 through 18. Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shares in their humanity, so that by his death we might break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is the devil. So since the children, talk, talking about us, we're the children, have flesh and blood, he too had to come and have humanity. He had to have flesh and blood also. And free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. For surely it is not angels he helps, but Abraham's descendants. For this reason, and Abraham's descendants is all people. So all people can be helped by Jesus Christ. For this reason, he had to make them he had to be made like them, fully human in every way. That's the words I wanted to get to you tonight. He was fully human in every way in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God and that he might make an atonement for the sins of his people because he himself suffered when he was tempted. He was able to help those who are also being tempted. So he came again. The creator came down as a human man, as a created man, to die, to be tempted the same way that we're tempted, to understand the pain that we live in, to understand how hard it is not to sin, so that he would suffer and die so that we could be with God. Hebrews 4, 14 through 16 then. So then, since we have a great high priest, Jesus, who as, has entered heaven, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold firmly to what we believe. This high priest of ours understands our weaknesses, for he faced all the same testings that we do. Yet he did not sin. So let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. There we will receive his mercy and we'll find grace to help us when we need it most. There's a little bunny trail there. 
It says, so let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. I mentioned this when I was talking about worship. In the Old Testament, you could not talk to God. You had to go to a priest who had to go through a very long ceremony, and then, then he could go into the innermost part of the temple, and he could then pray to God and communicate with God. So Jesus Christ came, he tore the veil in the temple when he was raised, so that we don't have to do that anymore. We can freely speak to God all the time. And that's why it says that, because the people at the time would have understood that, holy cow, I can talk to God now? That was a big thing. That was huge. Luke 18, 31. Taking the 12 disciples aside, Jesus said, listen, we're going up to Jerusalem, where all the predictions of the prophets concerning the Son of Man, who is Jesus, will come true. He will be handed over to the Romans, and he will be mocked treated shamefully and spit upon. They will flog him with a whip and kill him, but on the third day he will rise again. So again, this is Jesus talking, and he's talking about himself. He's saying, there were all these prophecies in the past that were talking about me. Because I am fully man, I will be whipped and I will be killed, and I will allow it to happen for you. That's what he's saying there. 1 Timothy 2, 5 through 6. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men. I read this already, but I want to read it again. The man Jesus Christ, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. So again, God came down to earth so that we could communicate with him. Psalm 8, 3 through 4. When I look at the night sky and you see the, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars you set in place, what are mere mortals that you should think about them, human beings that you should care for them? Again, that was Jesus Christ. He is the creator. He is the one. When I look at the night sky and I see the work of your fingers, the work of whose fingers? Jesus. Jesus designed the night sky. He designed the entire universe. He designed the way that the, the gravity works and all the different laws of physics. Did you, have you guys, has anybody ever thought about that before? Really? Has, has that any, crossed anybody's mind? It has? That Jesus Christ did it? That is awesome. The thing that I want you to understand tonight is that when you're out in the world, if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, when you're out talking to people, that person that you're talking to, the person that you're being rude to, the person that you're being nice to, the person that you helped or didn't help or open the door for, they were created by Jesus Christ. Think about that. They were designed thoughtfully and carefully so that they would become the person that they are by Jesus Christ himself. This is a long one, but I think I want to read it. In, uh, earlier when I said Jesus was talking about the prophecies that he was going to, to fulfill, this is the prophecy. It's Isaiah 53. Who has believed our message? To whom has the Lord revealed his powerful arm? My servant grew up in the Lord's presence like a tender green shoot, like a root in dry ground. There was nothing beautiful or majestic about his appearance, nothing to attract us to him. This just said that Jesus was ugly, by the way. It's talking about Jesus. It said there's nothing beautiful or majestic about his appearance. There was nothing to attract us to him. Pretty weird, right? He was despised and rejected, a man of sorrow, acquainted with deepest grief. He turned, we turned our backs on him and looked the other way. He was despised and we did not care. Shh. Yet, it was our weakness he carried. It was our sor sorrows that weighed him down. And we thought his troubles were a punishment from God, a punishment for his own sins. But he was pierced for our rebellion. He was crushed for our sins. 
He was beaten so that we could be made whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. All of us, like sheep, have strayed away. We have left God's path to follow our own. Yet the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. He was oppressed and treated harshly, yet he never said a word. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep is silent before the shearers, he did not even open his mouth. Unjustly condemned, he was led away. No one cared that he died without descendants, that his life was cut short in midstream. But he was cut down for the rebellion of my people. He had done no wrong and had never deceived anyone. But he was buried like a criminal and he was put in a rich man's grave. But it was the Lord's good plan to crush him and to cause him grief. Yet when his life is made an offering for sin, he will have many descendants. He will enjoy a long life and the Lord's good plan will prosper in his hands. When he sees all that is accomplished by his anguish, he will be satisfied. And because of his experience, my righteous servant will make it possible for many to be counted righteous, for he will bear the sins of all. I will give him the honors of a victorious soldier because he exposed himself to death. He was counted among the rebels and he bore the sins of many and interceded for those rebels. Isn't that crazy that that was wrote like 1,500 years before Jesus was born? That was a prophecy about his life. And that's what he knew was going to happen. When in Luke he said that he'll be handed over to the Romans and he'll be mocked and treated shamefully and spit upon, they will flog him with a whip and kill him. That was prophesied by himself because he is God. Let's pray. Again, I like praying, guys. So sorry. Father, again, thank you for this masterful plan that you have created from the beginning to reconcile us, reconcile us to you. Because without that plan, we would be dead. We'd be dead in our sin. We'd have no life. We'd have no peace. But because of this master plan, because of the, the shame and the sin that Jesus bore and the weight that crushed him, we can be free and we can be alive. We thank you for sacrificing yourself for us. I pray that when we go home tonight, throughout the week, through throughout the month, we remember that the people that we see, that everyone that we see was designed by the master creator, Jesus Christ. And that we treat them accordingly. It's in your name we pray. Amen.